Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so we've discussed uh, the uh, transition phase now, where you go from just having uh, these uh, anti-citrullinated uh, protein antibodies within your blood to actually having synovitis. Okay, and this transition occurs when uh, you produce an anti-citrullinated protein um, antibody against um, citrullinated fibrinogen, which results in these uh, immune complexes that are circulating within the blood. And then if you get some sort of insult to uh, a synovial joint, then that can lead to increased vasopermeability. This immune complex of uh, citrullinated uh, fibrinogen with the anti-citrullinated fibrinogen antibody uh, can then move into the interstitial fluid of the synovium and there it can activate uh, sentinel cells, okay, which then release pro-inflammatory mediators, uh, which leads to uh, the acute inflammatory response, which overall uh, leads to the formation of an inflammatory exudate and also the recruitment of leukocytes into the interstitial fluid of the synovium, and then they go into the synovial fluid from there. Okay, and we've seen so far how you get a positive feedback of this because uh, as you produce an inflammatory exudate, what happens is you bring in more immune complexes uh, which involve uh, citrullinated fibrinogen with the anti-citrullinated fibrinogen antibody, which is then going to activate the sentinel cells all over again and lead to more pro-inflammatory mediators being released. And uh, you're also uh, going to get uh, anti-citrullinated uh, protein antibodies that are against unknown citrullinated proteins uh, within the synovium coming into the interstitial fluid of the synovium and then they form immune complexes with their antigen and both of these immune complexes as well as activating uh, the uh, FC gamma receptors uh, on the surface of the sentinel cells they also lead to the activation of the uh, classical complement pathway so these C1 con uh, complexes bind to the FC regions of uh, IgG and IgM antibodies and we know that the main type that you're going to produce is IgG okay so it will bind to the FC region of these antibodies involved in these immune complexes and once this C1 has bound to the FC region of IgG or IgM uh, immunoglobulins uh, it then becomes active and it will catalyze the breakdown of C4 and C2 Two. And I should say that all of these complement proteins have come into the interstitial fluid because uh, they came in in the inflammatory exudate. They're circulating in the blood in inactive forms. Okay, and they then start to break. Well, the C1 complex, once it's activated, starts to break down C4 and C2. It breaks C4 into C4A and C4B and breaks C2 into C2B and C2A. The C4B, which is the big fragment of C4, then assembles on the glycoproteins uh, on the surface of cells, and uh, then C2A sticks on top of that and makes the C4B C2A complex, uh, which is then a C3 convertase, which will break down C3 into C3B and C3A. C3A is an anaphyla toxin, while C3B will bind to another complement protein called C5. And then this C3B C5 uh, complex can then be broken down by the C4B C2A uh, complex. And it will break it down into another C3B, so the C3B will be regenerated. And then you break down the C5 into C5B and C5A. Uh, now C5B can go, go on to um, create membrane attack complexes, but we're interested in the C3A and the C5A, which are anaphylatoxins, and these the levels of C3A and C5A are going to go up in the interstitial fluid of the synovium, and they will act on receptors on the surface of the mast cells in the uh, synovium. Okay, so C3A has a C3A receptor, and C5A has a C5A receptor on the surface of mast cells and they will trigger activation of these mast cells and the mast cells will then degranulate releasing their granules which remember are full of histamine okay so um, C3A and C5A are going to come and act on receptors so C3A has a C3A receptor and C5A has a C5A receptor so I'll put C3AR slash C5AR to mean either the C3A receptor or the C5A receptor. 
Okay, right, depending on whether you're talking about C3A or C5A, and this will trigger more histamine release, which will therefore cause positive feedback of the inflammatory response as well. So you're going to get more and more synovitis, basically. This is how this process just continues on and on and on. You'll have this chronic inflammatory response going on within your uh, synovial joint. Okay, right. Now let's discuss another component. So this is going to cause the swelling of the joint. We've seen how it causes swelling. Let's discuss one of the aspects which is going to lead to pain. Okay, so let's discuss the calocrine kinin system. Okay, so basically the calocrine kinin system involves uh, proteins which are in the blood, coming out of the blood and activating, basically. Okay, so let me show you this. So the calocrine kinin system is its name. Okay, so there are three proteins that are going to be very important in this, which are within the blood, basically. So, I'll draw a blood vessel here. So there are three proteins which are very important. Okay, so the first, which I'll draw here, is what's known as heavy molecular weight and this is often abbreviated to HMW for short. So he heavy molecular weight kininogen. Okay, and this is a protein that is produced by the liver. In fact, all three of these proteins that I'm going to show you that are within the blood and are involved in the calocrine kinin system are within the are made by the liver. Okay, so this is heavy molecular weight kininogen. Okay. So I'll colour, whoops, kininogen, that's fine. Right, okay, so let me colour this in in red. So this is heavy molecular weight kininogen in red here. Okay, uh, and uh, let's show some more. So there are three proteins that are going to be very important in this. Heavy molecular weight kininogen is one. Okay, the next one is a protein known as pre -calocrine. Okay, and precalocrine again is made in by the liver and put into the blood and is inactive. So all of these proteins are absolutely fine and will do absolutely nothing as long as they just move around and around and around and around and around in the bloodstream and never leave the bloodstream. You see, they have very boring lives. All they do is go round and round in the bloodstream and all they ever see is the other components of the blood and the endothelial cells. Now, if they ever leave the bloodstream, suddenly they see a whole host of new molecules. And this is going to trigger the calocrine kinin system, as we'll see. Now, precalocrine has another name. It's also called Fletcher Factor, okay? But precalocrine probably is the more uh, used name than Fletcher Factor. Wikipedia is the only way I found out that precalocrine was called Fletcher Factor. Okay, right. So, one final. Uh, protein over here in blue is known as factor 12. So this is involved in the coagulation cascades as well. It's very important there as well, but it's also involved in kick-starting the uh, calocrine kinin system. So it is coagulation factor 12. And coagulation factor 12 is so important, it's also got another name. It's also known as Hageman factor. Right, so these proteins are all circulating in inactive form until suddenly they get into this synovial joint where this synovitis is occurring and there are great holes in the sides of the capillaries and the post-capillary venules and then suddenly they can get out of the bloodstream and go into the interstitial fluid and they see a whole host of new molecules which they can interact with. Now, what is the key molecule that they're going to see that's going to activate them? Well, a key component of the extracellular matrix is collagen. Okay, so this is co of collagen fiber here. Okay, and what happens is that factor 12 is the first one. Factor 12 binds to collagen and becomes active. It becomes factor 12A, okay? And often people drop the factor and just write 12A. Okay, if you wanted its long name, it would also be called activated Hageman factor. Okay, so when Hageman factor or factor 12 comes out of the blood, suddenly it sees collagen. And I want to stress that when it was circulating within the blood, it was never ever allowed to see collagen. 
the endothelial cells did not have collagen on their surface, the blood did not contain collagen. It was never, ever allowed to see collagen. But now suddenly it's left the bloodstream and now all over the place is collagen and it binds to it. Okay, so let me circle factor 12a in blue here. Okay, and it becomes active, and now it's going to activate precalocrine. So precalocrine also comes out of the blood, and it's now going to be converted by uh, factor 12a into an activated form. So precalocrine will go in, and it's going to be converted to the active form, which is calocrine. Okay, and again, if you were using the name Fletcher factor, then you'd call it activated Fletcher factor. Okay, now what does the enzyme calocrine do? Because this now is the active enzyme here, so we'll draw it as a little enzyme. Okay, so here is the active calocrine now. What's it going to do? Well, it's going to work on, firstly, not only heavy molecular weight kininogen, which has come in uh, to the interstitial fluid from the blood, okay, which is going to be now converted into bradykinin, Okay, but it's also going to work on another component, um, on another substrate rather, which is already present in the interstitial fluid. So there is another uh, kininogen basically, which is called low molecular weight kininogen. And this uh, kininogen is not uh, made by the liver and put into the bloodstream. Instead, it's made by normal cells all over your body. So all of the cells in all of the tissues of your body produce low molecular weight kininogen, which is often referred to as LMV, sorry, LMW, kininogen, okay? Uh, and they secrete it into the extracellular fluid, the interstitial fluid, and suddenly when calocrine is activated because you've brought uh, first the Hageman factor out of the blood and then pre-calocrine out of the blood and they've activated one another, well, Factor 12's become active and it's activated pre-calocrine to calocrine. Suddenly, this calocrine enzyme can then act on the low molecular weight kininogen and convert it into calidin. Okay, so the heavy molecular weight kininogen which has come out of the blood into the interstitial fluid that gets converted to bradykinin. The low molecular weight kininogen, which is already in the interstitial fluid, that gets converted to calidin, okay? And these two molecules are then, firstly, they're going to go to the blood vessels and they're going to cause type 1 activation, just like histamine, okay? And therefore, they are going to lead to positive feedback of the inflammatory response again, okay? But also, they're going to act on receptors on sensory neurons, and that's going to lead to messages being sent to the brain. Now, which sensory neurons do you think they're going to have receptors on? Well, it's pain sensory neurons. So they're going to trigger pain, dolor, in dead Italian, okay? Uh, and they're also going to make you stop using the joint, so they're also going to cause loss of function, okay? Functio lisa in um, dead Italian again. So often the um, hallmarks of inflammation aren't uh, written in English, they're written in uh, Latin usually, so pain, they're called the five signs of Celsius, okay, so I'll just write about this down here, so basically you can, ca you can, the five symptoms of inflammation are called the five signs of Celsius, okay, and because these were described so long ago, they're written in Latin basically, so the first is tumor, okay, for swelling, okay, pain is dolor, okay, loss of function wasn't actually originally put uh, in by uh, Celsius, it was added later, okay, but it now is considered a sign of Celsius, so it's functio lisa, and then there are two other ones as well, what are they, calor, which is increased um, heat, okay, so it feels hotter, the inflamed area feels hotter, and that's because you've got increased blood flow there, uh, so if you've got more blood pumping for an area, it's going to make it feel hotter because blood is warm, okay, and also uh, rubor, uh, because again, uh, if you've got a lot of blood flowing for an area, it's going to appear red, so rubor is for redness. Okay, so those are the five signs of Celsius. Tumor, dolor, functio, lisa, calor, and rubor.
Okay, right. Uh, so, Brady, Kynan, and Kaladin are going to be one of the ways that you um, feel pain as an inflamed area. So the joints are going to become very painful, basically. Now, there are other things which cause the pain as well, but Brady, Kynan, and Kaladin are a major uh, way by which uh, inflamed areas become painful. Okay, right. So, let's look at another thing that the... Uh, the um, inflammatory exude date is going to produce. We've seen the complement cascades, we've seen now the chylocrine kinin system. Let's also talk about coagulation. Okay, so basically we've seen that um, once you move Hageman factor out of the blood, it becomes activated to uh, factor 12a. Okay, or activated Hageman factor, and that that activates the pre calocrine to calocrine. But in fact, there are other things that 12A also activates. So, for instance, it also activates the, intrins the intrinsic coagulation cascade. Okay, uh, so let's just briefly talk about this. It doesn't take too long to describe the intrinsic coagulation cascade. So, basically, factor 12A is then going to act on another coagulation protein that's been brought in, basically. Okay, so it's going to act on uh, factor 11. Okay, so I'll put factor 11 here. So here's factor 11, and basically it's going to convert it to factor 11A. Okay, and then factor 11A works on factor 9. Okay, so where's your... Whoops, that's not factor 11, I've written factor 9 there. Sorry, my Roman numerals are all messed up. Okay, so cross that out. That's factor 9 that I've put there. This is factor 11 here. Okay, so x1 is factor 11. Okay, like 12 is x2. Okay, and then this is going to activate factor 9, the symbol for which is this. So factor 9 is going to be activated to factor 9a. Okay, here. And now, factor 9a is not going to work on its own. It has a cofactor, basically. So it's going to combine uh, with factor uh, 8. Uh, now, what's the symbol for 8? 8 is like so. It's going to combine with factor 8a, like so. And the two of them together are then going to catalyze the uh, conversion of factor 10 to 10a. So let me just discuss 8a for a moment with you. Okay, so, basically, what is a cofactor? Let me give you the concept of what a cofactor is. Okay, so, basically, here is an enzyme. So, 9a is an enzyme. It's the main bulk of the enzyme. Okay, so it has the active site, and it's capable of catalyzing a reaction. Now, a cofactor for an enzyme is a little thing which needs to slot into the enzyme, basically, uh, in order for it to actually work. So without this final piece, the enzyme won't work. So that's what 8A is. It's a little piece which slots into 9A in order to actually activate uh, 9A and allow it to actually catalyze the reaction. So you've already activated 9 to 9A, and before you've activated 9 to 9A, it won't even combine uh, with 8A. So there's two steps in the activation of 9A, really. You have to activate 9 to 9A, and then you have to combine it with the cofactor 8A in order for them to actually catalyze the reaction they're going to catalyze. And the reaction they're going to catalyze is the conversion of factor 10 which is just X, into factor 10A. Now, factor 10A is just like 9A. Again, it, there's two steps in its activation, really. It now has to combine with its cofactor, and its cofactor is 5A. Okay, so the two of those need to combine together. And you might wonder, well, where do 8A and 5A come from? But I'll discuss that in a moment. Okay, and then what's going to happen is that 10A, once it's got its cofactor, which is 5A, bound into it, is then going to convert factor 2, which is also called prothrombin, okay? And all of these coagulation factors in their inactive forms have come into the interstitial fluid in the inflammatory exudate, into factor 2A, which is also called thrombin. Okay, so... Uh, 
unfortunately, we're now going to have to go over the page. Uh, or at least maybe I could try and squeeze it in here, because otherwise we're going to lose all of this. Right, so, we've converted 2 to 2A. Now, 2A is going to do everything from here, okay? So, 2A then performs the most important conversion of them all. It converts factor 1 into factor 1A. Now, do you remember me telling you what factor 1 was? Factor 1 was another name for fibrinogen, okay? It was the old name for fibrinogen. So, factor 1 is so important it's been given another name, which is fibrinogen. And factor 1A is then called fibrin, okay? So, remember, fibrinogen was this protein that we had uh, produced an antibody against the citrullinated form of it, okay? Uh, so, it's doubly important in rheumatoid arthritis, but here it is in the uh, coagulation cascade, and I should just say that this is what's known as the intrinsic coagulation cascade, and it's catalyzed, well, it's set off, rather, uh, by um, the uh, exposure of factor 12 to collagen. Okay, right, uh, so when you have the coagulation factor, factor 12, exposed to co collagen, it sets off this entire cascade. And overall, what now happens is that thrombin gets activated and it converts factor 1 into factor 1A. And now, factor 1A is going to be converted into fibrin strands. So, fibrin is going to be assembled into fibrin strands. So, it's a little protein, basically. Uh, but you can assemble it into huge, great strands. Uh, and the enzyme which uh, assembles it into huge, great strands is called factor 13A, okay? And again, where does the activated 13A come from? Well, it was activated from factor 13, and basically, thrombin is responsible for producing the factor 13. So, not only does thrombin catalyze the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin, but it also catalyzes the conversion of factor 13 into factor 13A, and then factor 13A assembles the fibrin uh, monomers into huge, great strands. Okay, now the point of this in a normal um, inflammatory response is that you produce a fibrin meshwork, okay, a great spider's web of fibrin, which is aimed at containing the pathogen and stopping it from spreading. I mean, the, uh, the nightmare scenario is that it gets into the bloodstream, okay, so that's what the coagulation cascades are for in the acute inflammatory response, they contain the pathogen. Okay, so I promised to tell you where the factor 8A and factor 5A come from. Well, basically, thrombin is responsible for the production of 5A and 8A. And you might find that slightly counterintuitive, because in order to get activated thrombin, you needed these already activated, but they're not activated until the thrombin is there. That seems, uh, you know, there's a problem there, okay? But the thing is, there will always be a little bit of factor 8A and 5A available, so you'll always be able to produce this pathway a tiny bit as long as factor 12A becomes activated. And once you've produced it a little bit, then it will have a positive feedback mechanism because thrombin then will produce loads of these cofactors, and that will suddenly speed the whole thing up so that you get much more thrombin being produced, and therefore you get this positive feedback, basically. So really, you should view thrombin leading to the production of these two as a positive feedback loop. Okay, right. So, uh, let's now talk about the other coagulation cascades. So there is another coagulation cascade, which is the extrinsic coagulation cascade. Okay, so I'll put this here. Extrinsic, whoops, no, no, not like that. Coagulation cascade. Okay, right. Uh, so, this one is also going to be activated when uh, the coagulation factors leave the blood. Okay, uh, but it's not activated by collagen this time. Instead, this is activated by a protein that is on the surface of all peripheral cells. So all peripheral cells in your body have a certain protein on their surface. So let me draw this here. So I'll put it in pink here. So this protein in pink here is a protein known as tissue factor. Okay, 
and it's also called factor 3. So tissue factor or coagulation factor 3. Okay, now coagulation factor 3 is the odd one out. It is not in the liver, basically. I'm oh, sorry, it's not in the blood, and it's not produced by the liver. Well, it will be produced by the liver, but it's not circulating in the blood, basically. Instead, it's, um, it's on the surface of all peripheral cells in your body. Okay, but it is not, repeat, it is not on the apical surface of endothelial cells of the blood vessels. So circulating coagulation factors never, ever, ever see tissue factor. So when they're usually circulating in the bloodstream, they will see components of the blood and they'll see the apical surface of the endothelial cells. And tissue factor is neither within the blood nor is it on the surface of the endothelial cells, at least not on their apical surface. Okay, however, when you allow the coagulation factors to leave the blood and go into the interstitial fluid, suddenly they will see cells which are covered in tissue factor. Okay, and what happens is that another coagulation factor is going to be activated the instant it sees tissue factor. So factor 7 Coagulation factor 7 is going to be activated to factor 7A when it sees tissue factor, okay? Uh, and then what's going to happen is that 7A is going to act to activate factor 10, okay? So it will convert 10 to 10A, okay? 10A will then combine uh, with 5A, okay? Remember, it's cofactor. And together, those two will convert uh, factor 2, which, remember, was prothrombin, into factor 2A, okay? And then thrombin, so I'll label this up as thrombin here. Thrombin will then do two things, two very important things. It will convert fibrinogen factor 1 into fibrin factor 1A, and it will also activate the conversion of uh, factor 13, yep, three of those, into uh, factor 13A, okay, and factor 13A will then assemble the fibrin, or the factor 1A, into uh, fibrin strands, and you'll produce a fibrin meshwork, basically. So, both the intrinsic and extrinsic coagulation cascade will be occurring when you uh, open the holes in the sides of the blood vessels and allow uh, the coagulation factors out into the interstitial fluid of the synovium. Okay, and this will result in the production of loads of these fibrin strands. So what gradually happens is the intima, this outer layer of the synovium, remember, this gradually actually becomes replaced just with fibrin. So you just end up with fibrin all over the place, and gradually the cells are almost replaced just by this layer of fibrin. Okay, so you get this fibrin cap, as it's called, uh, which um, faces the synovial fluid. Okay, so you produce what's known as a fibrin cap. Okay, right. So... That now summarizes what's going to happen in the synovitis of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, we're now, in the next video, going to turn our attention to what triggers the destruction of the bone, basically. So this is the synovitis. This is the swelling. We've got the pain. This is rheumatoid arthritis now, the articular part of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, now what we want to look at is what is going to cause uh, the loss of bone, basically. What is going to cause the erosion of the bone? And this is going to be another adaptive immune response, basically.